Hey guys, welcome back to the Inner Circle. Today we're going to be online. Um, we couldn't all be in person together for this review, but the show must go on. Today we have special guests from the How to Otaku podcast, which you can listen to on Spotify. Uh, this is Josh Thorne Hello. and Brogan McGowan. Everybody. I've never had flesh before. This is the first time I've had flesh. <laughs> They're real. They're not just disembodied voices. <laughs> I mean, did you really, like, you know, I've been trying so hard to, like, you know, actually, like, find a way to make myself look presentable, you know, and I've finally, like, I think I've gotten there. What would you guys think? Like, you know, am I presentable? I like the haircut. Yeah. I know, the the, the cut's fresh, G. Yeah, it's it's better than what I've had pretty much at any other point in my life, so, you know. It's definitely a good skin suit you're wearing. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. I, gosh, I told you, you not to tell them about the skin suits. Ah, oh, that makes my bones itch. <laughs> I got uh, a recommendation from Mark Zuckerberg himself, so, you know. The Zuck. The Zuck. Well, anyway, today's episode is, is very special because uh, not only has How to Otaku, uh, you know, volunteered to come on the show with us, but we're going to be talking about something that's a little bit more up their alley. Uh, we, today we're going to be reviewing Ghost in the Shell, the, the very beloved cyberpunk anime from the, nine, uh, was 1995 when it came out? 96. 96. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'd like to get into a little bit of our, our personal histories with Ghost in the Shell, uh, but since you guys are guests, let's uh, start off with you. Go ahead, Josh. Um, I don't really have much of a history with this. Like, um... Actually, like, you know, the, the, the hook of our show is that I haven't seen much anime at all, and so, like, Brogan is, like, introducing me into the medium, you know, and, like, like I don't have, like, this big, like, backlog of, like, you know, all the anime I've seen before. However, one of the things that I had seen before we started the show, on top of, like, you know, like, a few Studio Ghibli movies and um, the film we're discussing on our podcast, Acura, um... I had seen Ghost in the Shell previous to our like to the show that we started because you know we the library had like a DVD copy and it just piqued my interest so I checked it out you know and then like honestly I felt a little bit underwhelmed but we can get into that later but you know and then you know I don't know that that's my history with the the movie I guess this is one of those rare circumstances where Josh has more experience with this franchise than I do, uh, in that my only exposure to Ghost in the Shell was the Ghost in the Shell standalone complex game that came out, like, two years ago, and fucking Neo Tokyo, that weird, uh, like, cyberpunk CSGO shooter mod for, like, Half-Life that came out in, like, 2011 or some shit that I played the fuck out of, and then it just disappeared off the face of the earth, because nobody played it anymore. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this movie. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. I, I had no idea that you had like such little exposure to Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, I, I, no, honestly, I, like I would have, I would have pegged you for for the guy to know everything about it. It's really, I, I'm, I. There are a lot of shows that I have uh, that are kind of like gaps in my knowledge that you would expect me to have seen. Like, um, insert example here. I don't really have one off the top of my head, but um, Ninja Scroll. I, maybe Ninja Scroll. Have you guys not seen Ninja Scroll? No. What's Ninja Scroll. What a Ooh. boring name. What the Are you? No, 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 no. Okay. This so, is literally the first I'm hearing of this. Hold on. We're 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 gonna review Ghost in the Shell. Is it a fun uh, software game? No, no. This is an anime. Oh. Um, yeah. Batman Ninja. What are we talking about? No, no. It's it's a '90s anime movie. Um, I watched it on Hulu like a year ago, and it's it's awesome. Like. I'm a shock that you haven't. You guys have watched Akira and, and Ghost of Shell, and you haven't seen Ninja Scroll. I think I've heard of this before, but I've never seen it. Nobody it's, it's has like, ever spoken of it to me. So, to my knowledge, like Ninja Scroll is something that gets looped into the sort of anime movie world, or that 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 conversation like pretty often. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like that in in Vampire Hunter D. Um, yeah, that's 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 the one that I'm more familiar with. Uh, okay. Well, I've never heard of Ninja Scroll, but I have heard of Ghost in the Shell. I think everybody's yeah. heard of Ghost in the Shell at this point. I mean, Scarlett Johansson was in was in that questionable 
Did anybody actually see that? I did not see I it. I'm gonna bring um, that up at a certain I can, point. I can, I'm not. Yeah, no, I can I can get into that comparison. Um, we'll we'll talk about it in, in a minute, but um, I I want to I want to get your personal experience with uh, with the movie Clayton. Okay, uh, I'm ten years old. I'm at a public library. There's this uh, weird anime woman's face on the cover of something called Ghost in a Shell. That's a pretty cool title. I watch it. I don't understand it. Kind of boring. Forget about it for uh, uh, 117 years. Scarlett Johansson movie comes out. I watched the original again. I love it. And I realized that uh, The Matrix rips off like at least half of that, half the movie and half the premise and some of the shots. Wait, you said you were like 10 when you watched this movie with like full female yeah. frontal nudity? Like, Yeah, yeah my, par- <laughs> my parents didn't care. I was in my bedroom alone as a child with my DVD pole. Genuinely, oh, in 20 minutes alone. of this movie, I was like, yeah, imagine explaining this to your parents. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, th- this is one of those films that would have gotten me in trouble as a child in, in, in the Hall household, for sure. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, okay, so, so my personal experience with the movie, um, kind of similar to, to yours, Clayton, except I didn't find it at the library. I, I found it at Blockbuster. Oh, oh yeah, God, boy. yeah, you are old. Sort of date this experience and, and date me. Like, I was probably, like, five or six, but, like, I, I have the memory, like, severely etched into my brain because the, the cover of the DVD was, like, anime woman, but completely topless, and she had, like, cables coming out of her. It was, like, really kind of a haunting image for, for a six-year-old. Um, and I never watched it in one day in high school. Uh, the Scarlett Johansson movie was coming out, so I figured I'd give it a watch, and uh, uh, ho- holy shit, like, I've only seen it, like, watching it again to prepare for this review was only my second time seeing it, and I feel, it's one of those movies that you can kind of take something new home with you every time you see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, what's the best way to implant yourself in a new skin suit? Exactly. <laughs> That's what and, I wanted to know, like, and it told me. Like you mentioned, the Matrix. Like we're we're currently working on uh, our our Matrix review. That's going to be probably debuting before before this one does. But uh, it, you're right, Clayton. Like it's crazy how much of an uh, influence anime has on on the Matrix, especially this movie. Like something about the Japanese in the '90s. Like they loved exploring human consciousness. They were like mm-hmm. on that kick for a while. It seems. Yeah. The um. The connection between that and Matrix is like very, very strong. Like, I actually read that they, um, that the Wachowskis actually, like, when they were pre- they were pitching the movie, they like gave the producer a copy of Ghost in the Shell and were like, "We basically want to do this, but in live action." And that was like part of the pitch, you know? Oh wow, I I didn't even know that. Yeah, you guys are all gonna yell at me. It's been like five years since the last time I've seen the Matrix, and that was the first time I saw the Matrix. Other than, like, aesthetics, I don't quite understand the comparison. Like, I like I get it, but at the same time, like, it's not... Unless I'm, like, dumb, I don't see okay, so outside of the aesthetization. I, th- I think a lot of it comes down to thematic stuff. Like, what's, what's really real? I gotcha. What's the real you? Um, I think, like, kind of very minorly like to jacking into other people and jacking into like yeah like the, the, hyper- the wires in the back of the head yeah by the well, way like matrix good movie you know check it out um yeah ideally, sure. if you have like a dolby vision 4k tv they have the new 4k dolby vision version on hbo max definitely check it out isn't there a oh, new wow. matrix movie coming out this year or is it yes. next year there yeah. Is. yeah matrix yeah. resurrections yeah. coming out Jesus in December. Christ. yeah the first Matrix movie to come out in 18 years. So mm-hmm. that's going to be hype. Um, but anyway, so I, I think we should probably cover a little bit about what the, the plot of the movie is. Because, like, it's, it's pretty complex. Um, and I don't think I, I even fully grasp, like, the full extent of it, even on my second yeah. watch. Like, first of all, this was, a, this was a manga before it was an anime, right? Mm-hmm. Have you guys read the manga? I have not. Um, I I I played like a PSP game, and I played like a competitive shooter that came out and died in like 
a three month span, and that was my entire exposure to Ghost in the Shell before I saw this movie this afternoon. But as far as I can tell, if you don't mind, uh, if you'd rather do the plot sub- synopsis, or I think, I think I might know a little bit about what's going on. I did read the subtitles and pay attention pretty good this time. All right. So what's <laughs> yeah? Let's go through what you like your plot synopsis for your first viewing. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm intrigued, Brogan. <laughs> Something, something, politics. You got Major Kusanagi. Uh, she's a cyborg. There's these two politicians that are, like, arguing over somebody's, like, immigration uh, status or something. It's very vague. Um, and then Major Kusanagi, standing on top of a building naked, does a backflip off, turns invisible, and shoots him in the head. Um... And then we start getting into, like, what the movie is actually about, where there is this entity called the Puppet Master who is uh, hacking into people's ghosts, which is, like, a, like, hyper-physically realized version of someone's consciousness or soul. Like, your ghost is the part of your brain that makes you the person that you are in this world, as opposed to your brain being the person that you are. Like, your brain is just, like, a vessel for memories and for for data, basically. But the ghost is your soul, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a future, where, to my understanding, where, like, the the soul can be transferred like how data can be transferred in a computer. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, so you've got this hacker that is going around taking control over um, people's ghosts. And he's doing all this. It's revealed towards the end to get at Major Kusanagi. Because he knows something about her that um, it seems like she doesn't really even know. Um, It seems like some of the people around her might know, and they definitely aren't telling her. Um, And so this has all been just a big game of cat and mouse from this government organization that developed this program that basically developed sentience and went rogue found Major Kusanagi and tried to form a blood pact with her to form a more enhanced life form. It's it's pretty heady stuff. Um, yeah. Like, I definitely didn't retain all of that upon this viewing, you know? I'm like... surprised you call all of that, <laughs> like, on your first run. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that was pretty comprehensive. Um, I, uh, kudos, man. Like, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, uh, yeah. But like, it's interesting. Like the, the the poll for for the like in terms of plot, the thing that interests me the most about this movie wasn't really the the whole like consciousness sentience part of, of like the the main villain being being an artificial intelligence. Like, I feel like that's sort of a a trope that gets done to death these days. Like you see it in Terminator, you see it in Chappie and RoboCop, like pretty much any movie. Yeah, Space Jam too. <laughs> for some reason. Um, but yeah, like that's a really common like like thread that you find in sci-fi. The thing that really pulled me into Ghost in the Shell in the first place was the fact that it's portraying a sort of dystopian future where literally everybody, like the norm of, of being human in this future world is being cybernetically enhanced. Like there's always a percentage of a person that is mechanical and not biological. And Cyberpunk that, 2077 is really drawing heavy from this. Yeah, and, like, that that whole concept of, like, every no one is 100% human anymore, like, that that kind of it fascinates me. Right, like, even the, the one guy that uh, Bato and uh, Kusanagi had on their team who had a really weird fascination with his Mateba... Um, he he was able to do like the hands-free like brain calm shit, 
even though they were like, you're like the closest thing to a like a basic human being that we've got on this team. And that guy even has the power to just like telepathically communicate. Yeah, like they they're they're all like connected to each other's brains like telepathically somehow. Mm-hmm. At least like the really like like big enhanced people are. Like I know the major is supposed to be like like the only part of her that's human is her brain, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, well, specifically the ghost. I think even parts of her brain are, are augmented in some way. And we have no idea how she got that way, do we? Not from Not this really. movie. No. Um, yeah, from yeah, what I understand further into the series they delve into that um but not from this movie oh so yeah, like in the original you don't learn her origins um that's something that i think's touched on i know it's touched on standalone complex and like so. i think you're right series i don't even think i don't even think ghost of the shell 2 the 2004 movie touches on it that's like it's a whole different story even though mm. it's the same character um but the, the scar joe movie touches on it it becomes the whole plot of that movie for the second half but you know i yeah. guess i guess this would be a good segue into talking about that movie like what what about for those of you that have seen the remake like what about it rubs you the wrong way what, what about it like sort of gets things right like what's the story there so halfway through the so comparing like the original here to the uh scar Joe movie Halfway through the ScarJo movie, um, and this is like based off my memory, I haven't rewatched it in a little bit, is uh, it, the whole Puppet Master thing kind of gets dropped and twisted a bit into it being her going on a search for her like birth mother and her real origins, like on her shell, if I remember correctly. Like, it was silly. It got weird, and I just it felt like it went way off base of what the story was supposed to be and how it started since the movie started is kind of trying to be a like a one to one adaptation do do you know like how accurate the the animated movie is to the manga versus the scarjo movie uh, well I can't read so I've never read the manga <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i I know that we haven't read the manga, but like I was curious if anybody like knew of of whether or not like it was faithful. I mean, I would wager to guess that the anime adaptation is probably a little closer yeah, than I... the ScarJo film. That being said, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there's some, in some way, shape, or form in this bastardized Hollywood version of it that they were like, oh, well, we're also going to take, we're going to take this and we're going to change it a little bit, but we're also going to adapt this other part of it. And then they just kind of butcher both of them. So it wouldn't be at all surprising to me if they were pulling from, like, some sort of source and not just flying blind. But it is equally as likely to me that they would do that as they would just go blind and just fucking figure it out and say, this is what you want, right? Yeah, honestly, if if modern Hollywood and, and the sequel trilogy are to be learned from, I think it's more likely that they were making it up as they went. Mm. Um, but I haven't seen the ScarJo movie, so I can't say for sure. Uh, something that I, I wanted to t- a touch on, though, is like um, is like anime li- live action adaptations, especially like American ones, generally not good. You guys have seen the the Death Note uh, Netflix movie, right? That's yeah. the one that I've seen front to back. And um, no, it is not a good movie. And I don't have a comparison point because I haven't seen the original anime. But it, it's just not a functional movie, really. Like, and, and this is this is sort of like this helps my argument because my, my personal opinion is that you shouldn't try to adapt anime into live action. It doesn't matter if you're in Japan or if you're in America. Just just leave it alone. Yeah, like, I I think that like part of the problem is that like. When you're making an animated anything, you have like a you have a much wider range of like um suspension of disbelief because you know going into an animated movie, you're already kind of buying into an idea of a fantasy more so than a live action film. You're buying into the idea that these drawings that you're seeing on the screen are actually people. So like you can buy a little bit more of like dream logic and um you know, like, just suspend your disbelief a little more, whereas, like, in the real world, you expect things to just be a little bit more, like, 
like straightforward and like specific in their clarity. So like I think that's just kind of the problem you run into and also the fact that like you know aesthetically it's pretty hard if not impossible to make uh live action films that look and feel the same way that animated films do. So you're just like you're you're hurting yourself in that regard as well. Baseline, you just don't get like the the natural extravagance that you can get through animation. I mean, with animation, you're not bound by literally the actual laws of physics unless you want to pay billions of dollars on CG. Like with animation, you're already just making shit up. Yeah. You're drawing things yep. that come to I'm your mind. John Favreau, and you're making the Lion King. You know, then, well, in the you, case of, then you're spending billions of dollars to make it look like you just filmed some lines in the Sahara. So, in the case of this animated movie in particular, you can um, you can do something that most people wouldn't give you the time to do in live action, and that's just have like ten minute scenes of water rippling or traffic driving down a street. Oh yeah, and it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's yeah. fucking beautiful. That's one of the like, things that I found like surprisingly different from what i expected going into it because like my my assumption going in and from what i've learned a lot of people's assumption going in was that this was like you know action-packed like you know uh super strong woman defeats lots of dudes to find the truth or whatever and like you know there's some of that but like a lot of the movie is like people like you know, going on about the philosophy of, like, you know, the cyberpunk world that they live in and, like, trying to figure out, like, how much of them is human and how much of them isn't, you yeah, know? It's, it's surprisingly introspective. Mm -hmm. and, and the older I get, like, like this, this is really the, the, the back pain man, pardon me speaking. Uh, I'm more interested in the introspective stuff than I am in the action. While the action in this movie is fantastic... Yeah, it's, it's it, like they can, they do a great job of conveying motion. There was a mm -hmm. uh, there was one scene near the end that really caught my attention when like she puts on her active camouflage, turns invisible, but she's like in a puddle of water, and she yeah. goes to jump on top of this tank, and you you follow the motion of her jumping based on the the water that's like streaming off of her body in the air. Yeah, like she jumps into the water, and there's you see like every footstep based on, like, the ripple in the water from where she would have stepped, but you don't see her. Then she does, like, a like a Samus and Smash Brothers, like, tail whip jump. No, yeah. it's, it's solid. Like, I mean, the amount of work that goes into animating something like that, it's such a small detail, but, like, it's an insane amount of dedication. Um, one of the many reasons why I love to watch anime is because, like, the Japanese are so dedicated to their craft. Uh, it's insane. Um, what was my original point before I got talking about the animation? Something about being an old man. Right, okay. Uh, I, li I like the introspective, introspective parts more than the action, because that's really what the movie is about. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get a hold of the subbed version, cause I, so I yeah. had to watch the dub. Yes. Um, and I feel like I'm missing a lot of, of uh, like emotion. Because the sub, like a lot of performances in the in in the dub are are like kind of wooden, weak. Am yeah, I the only they're, they're, person they're that weak. enjoys the dub. I feel like the dub works. It works. Some of the people being kind of flat, I feel like works. Like considering the cyborg world they're living in and how stoic a lot of them are, being a military unit. Well, it's it's funny to me because like the most stoic character is probably uh, other than Major is probably Bateau. Or is it Batu or Bateau? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's Bateau, but I'm gonna say Bateau. Uh, he's like the most human character in this entire movie, and then also um, the guy that drives the car with the revolver. Yeah, yeah the he's pretty. Guy. Yeah, he's pretty charismatic. But other than that, like everybody's really, like no pun intended, really robotic. Yeah, like. No fucking way. I'm sorry. I'm just doing a little bit of research. Um, <laughs> two points. The original budget of this film was uh, was three million. Well, two point eight million dollars uh, compared to the 2017 one, which was something like 
hundred. Like thirty million or like a hundred million or some shit. Um, so just like, mm-hmm. just putting that out there. But also, Richard Epcar. The reason that I knew this voice, um, Richard Epcar, who was the voice of uh, Bato in Ghost in the Shell, is uh, Joseph Joe Star in uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part Three onwards. So, just a little. I thought I, I'm happy for you. I'm happy that you now know this. <laughs> Wait, is is uh, is Brogan? Are you a big JoJo's fan too? I'm a huge JoJo's fan. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I, t- I take <laughs> it that I you enjoy, two aren't. I enjoy Ghost of the Shell because it's pretty much the opposite of what I've ever seen out of JoJo. Yes. I like watching these scenes of people sitting and talking philosophy while there's raindrops and moody cyberpunk things happening around them. No, Don't get like, it wrong. I love this shit too. I also really love big, strong, colorful man punch other big, strong, colorful man with funny ghost. Um, okay, can I um, can I say something about Ghost in the Shell? I want to like get get my biggest like issue with the movie out of the way and like you know see what you guys think about like my 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 hypothesis here. So my biggest issue with the movie is um, it's Matoko, right? The major, I guess, is her name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But my biggest problem with her is the major, and like. I don't think it's just a problem of the dub performance, although that certainly doesn't help. I think the problem is that, like, when you're when you're basically writing, like, any fictional narrative, one of the biggest things that you want to keep in mind, in my opinion, is, like, having a character who, like, has, like, agency and motive throughout. Like, who feels like they're propelling the narrative forward. And, like, they have a reason to do these things. Where and like I don't think that the major like really has a clear motive or um like a drive to get things done like you know at least that's narratively clear you know you can say that she's like good at her job and she just likes doing her job or whatever but it's not it's not really that interesting to me and so like it feels like the the first half of the movie is the first act and then like the the last half is the third act. You know, and there's like no second act really, where like things are like, where like the the, where like the major feels like she's like, she's now learned like what what's kind of going on, and she's like, you know, starting to dig deeper and deeper. You know, like like a normal detective movie. It's like it does feel a little rushed. Yeah. I feel like the manga probably alleviates a lot of those issues just by nature of it being able to be more long form in the way that it shows these things. Um, I will say, not to contradict you. Go ahead and contradict me. Like you know, I the... I think part of it is that the major is struggling with her ident with her own self identity, and her own free will. Like they bring it up a little bit towards the end when she's in the elevator with Bato, um, and she says something along the lines of, um. People like me don't really have any concept of whether or not we're human. Yeah. Um, I have no idea whether or not the the memories that I have are memories that I've created or memories that were given to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if I'm a person or not. The brain that's in me couldn't could just be not mine. And there are those glimpses of the other woman in the like in the office building window that looks exactly like her. Mm-hmm. I, I obviously I haven't read it, but I feel like there's a lot more of that in the manga, and just for time constraints, they had to. Yeah, that was one. That was one of the things I was thinking about when I, um, when I was like trying to like put together like why this didn't feel like quite the great experience that I wanted it to be. Was that like e- e- the movie's very short? It's like 88 minutes long, right? Yeah, it's like an hour, uh, an hour and twenty, minutes. or an hour and twenty. Or something like that. It's it's a very short movie. Like, you know, like, animated movies around the time are generally, like, 90 minutes long. But, like, even by animated movie standards, it's a little short. Mm. But, like, the... That's just the problem, is that, like, it feels like it's, like... It just feels a little bit off. And, like, um, the thing is that, like, the most interesting scene in the movie, I think, is, like, when they're on the boat talking, you know? 
like which is towards the middle of the movie but like that's the thing is like it doesn't feel like you know like the the first like big action point in the movie is the um the garbage man scene which like i really really love i love that scene but it doesn't feel like the major is like clearly set up as the main character at that point you know like i mean she kind of is but like we don't have a clear sense of her motive or anything but by that point you know her motives are set up in the later scene where she's on the boat so like it feels like her like her journey is starting after that scene but then like before she has any time to really investigate any further you know the um the the fuck what's the name of the the robot dude or like the consciousness that like enters that other body and the gets hit puppet by master it. The puppet master, yeah, the puppet master gets hit by that truck and then goes to the, gets sent into that base and then, you know, like, we get propelled into the third act, essentially. So, like, it feels like by the time we've set up what the major's deal is, where, you know, like, the puppet master essentially takes over and brings us, and, like, shotguns us to the third act before we can really get, like, that deeper sense of the character. So, that's kind of my problem. Yeah, uh, you had a question, AJ. Yeah, I I kind of have the same problem that that Josh has. Like, I feel I feel the same way about the major. As cool of a character as she is, she doesn't really get a lot of time in the, in the movie, at least, to like develop. Uh, yeah. At least to like a to a degree to where it feels satisfying and fulfilling. Yeah. Um, my my question is like, y- you saw a standalone complex, right, Brogan? Um, no, I played a game that was called standalone complex and was vaguely based on it but was just like a competitive shooter do we know if standalone complex is like a sequel to this series a spin-off or does it, it like it's a, it's a sequel that? it's a sequel it's, okay. it's like a sequel it's like a sequel reboot kind of thing i wouldn't call standalone complex and it's like it's it all of its side media um a direct sequel it's like a weird half it's like a reboot and reboot. continuation like the only they, direct they, sequel it, is the 2004 movie mm-hmm. but it doesn't it's story wise and development wise it goes a different route than like answering the questions from the abrupt ending of this one about like the merging i'm a involved. different being i am no longer yeah. the major <laughs> like, yeah it, it like it it addresses it but it doesn't it really focuses on something different so okay. As far as it, I can it, tell, it, it just kind of ignores it. It just like yeah, they they still all just go along like oh she's still the major. It's it's the continuing adventures of the major, pretty much. Okay, well that's interesting. You know it it it, it does um it continues the story in in some way, but I can't I couldn't pass judgment on it because I haven't seen it. Yeah. Um. So with that out of the way, um, I think we should talk about the ending. Like, you know, we haven't really addressed the ending in particular. Like, yeah, so... It's so, the biggest so, mindfuck part of the movie. Spoiler alert uh, coming up for those that haven't There's seen no it. There's no reason to say that. Sorry. So <laughs> we jumped this. into it. Sorry. There's like, no, we, we, say that? no, okay, I say that because we've had some mild spoilers, but to spoil the ending of a movie, I feel like is is a big thing. So just... Puppet just, Master merges with the Major, and then um, everything goes... Woo, and then the movie yeah. ends. Fuck you, Clayton. No subtlety at all. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, Clayton's right. That that happens in the movie. Thank you. Um, so, it, it, in the most Matrix fashion, uh, she she sort of unplugs herself from her reality by the end of the movie and enters in the child, or like the she enters into like a robot child body. Well, like the 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 idea I think is that they merge consciousnesses. And then, like, whatever that new merged, like, identity is, is inhabited by that child. So it's essentially, like, you know, some kind of, like, metaphorical, like, the creation of a child and the death yeah. of the two parents by by result. Yeah, it's like so. the, the, um, it's a big metaphor for birth, like, new life. Yeah, and, like, you know, like, humanity evolving and, like, you know... Uh, but evolving with like the um the the machine consciousness, so like basically the two fusing together to create a new whole, which is like, you know, it's kind of like this idea of like a, you know, 
like the only way for humans to evolve is to like basically stop being human and just become like you know sentiences within machines you know i didn't get any of that i thought this was an allegory about dragon ball fusion (laughs) (laughs) no but seriously the the like transcend like the transhumanism aspect here and like the argument for well I'm not saying it's this, this was ni- well, this was nineteen ninety six, nineteen ninety five before like this fucking thing was in everybody's pocket. And like I understand it was like theorizing about like the future, but the concept that we're all connected to the internet at all times, um, the concept that we are slowly approaching, uh, basically a, a, a unity point of everyone having access to all knowledge at all times. We're not far off from the concept of somebody saying, "Oh, well, uh, I'm Elon Musk, and uh, last week I took my rocket into space." And this week, I'm going to put my brain in the computer. Like, and so just the concept that we can, we can take, we can talk about the theoretical possibility of someone integrating their consciousness with a machine as opposed to an organic body and how we consider that. You're tumbling down the rabbit hole, Neo. (laughs) <laughs> the matrix has you <laughs> no no but, but in all seriousness yeah like I, I that's really my biggest issue with this film like while I, I nitpick about the major my biggest issue is like what the movie is really about the the transhumanism aspect is the most interesting part it's the meat of the film but it gets bogged down in favor of, of politics it's sort of the same problem. They talk a yeah. lot about politics that they don't actually go into depth on and don't mean anything for the thing that everybody's actually interested in. Yeah, it's like the, the well, entire it's... first half is is like drenched in politics, sort of like the Phantom Menace in, in that regard. And it gets it gets a lot to be a lot to swallow. Um Well, it's because this this movie, people never know what they it always all the like the marketing and stuff you hear about it is the opposite of what it really is. It's all just like a big think piece to pose these questions more so than it is some kind of like military action or anyone trying to actually answer the questions. It's about posing these questions and going, wow, look at that. That's fucking crazy, isn't it? <laughs> but, yeah, that's, that's the problem, though, is like I'm they, those... they made they made this movie so that the four of us shitheads would sit around and talk about it 30 years later. That's why they made this movie. I mean, it, you're definitely right. Like, uh, it, it inspires conversation, but that, that's the frustrating part about it for me is, like, I'm a guy that likes to have my answers, and that's all this movie does is pose questions. It doesn't answer anything. And, and while I love it for that, it also irritates the fuck out of me because now I'm going to be talking about it for, like, the next week and a half. Uh, I feel like that's the positive. That's, like, the p- most positive thing about it is that it doesn't try to answer some of these things that, honestly would just be worse off if they try to come up with an answer for it look at the scar jar version where they try to find answers yeah. for everything and no, it I, ruins the entire thing yeah no, i i agree that like it's it's better off like just being a, a a think piece than um yeah like having its own answer to its own questions it's better it's better just leaving things unsaid uh mm-hmm. but still like i i just i I guess now I think we should probably give it our, our ratings. Um, Clayton, let's start with you. What would you give Ghost in the Shell uh, 1 out of 10? Um, I like media that, that's smarter than me, so it makes me feel smart by proxy. Uh, but seriously, it's, it's like one of the most beautifully animated movies of all time to me. Um, not many things compare to it, but I'm also a big sucker for the art style and just like for the aesthetic. Um, but I don't know, like, Ghost in the Shell is like, it's like a 9 out of 10 for me. I'm like, putting a number on it. It's, it's up there. Like, it's one of the best. It was a little wonky the first time I saw it, like, and actually seriously watched it because 
you don't expect you don't expect it to flow the way it does or end the way it does. But after I knew it and I went back through it like more than once, it there, there's so much there, and I love it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely the the cyberpunk aesthetic that that gets me the most, um, at least in terms of interest. Like my favorite movie, you know this about me, Clayton, but my favorite movie is Blade Runner, um, and like. It, 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 like my favorite sci-fi is is like Blade Runner, Matrix, stuff that I, is really heady, um, introspective, and Ghost in the Shell is no exception. It fits right in with both of those movies really well. Um, it sort of forms a chain. Like Blade Runner inspired Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the Shell definitely inspired the Matrix. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and give it a eight out of ten. Mainly, it loses two points because of those two nitpicks that I have. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I would give it. I'm, I'm amazed that IGN. Let's let's uh, let's let's talk bad talk the movie. But nine out of ten, good for the whole family. <laughs> well, I think it's amazing that like you give it a nine out of ten and I give it an eight because usually I'm the one that gives the movie the higher score. And you don't give a lot of nines, do you? I give I give things sixes because a six is an average movie. Fair enough. Where's Josh think? Where's Josh think? That's what yeah. I'm like. Um, first of all, before I get into my thoughts, um, uh, AJ, did you hear that they made a sequel to Blade Runner? I, oh, I think yes. I think it's directed by some guy named Dennis. Um, Shut the fuck up! Shut the fuck up! That's not a funny joke anymore, Josh! We, 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 we love our boy time. Dennis. We talk about Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Finalve. Finalve. Uh, Dennis Finalve! <laughs> if you ever watch this, think- Denis... Please don't hate us. We love you. I think it got like a small theatrical release. You know, like um, it was in theaters for a couple of weeks. But fear is the <laughs> fucking mind killer. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Dude, hype. But yeah. anyway, um, so um, I think there's a lot of like really cool stuff about the movie. Like um, you know, the animation is obviously fantastic. Um, and like. It, it uses a lot of, like, groundbreaking, like, effects and stuff, like, you know, like, CGI effects, like, when she, like, when she's, like, entering, like, the, um, like, the cyber world and, like, it kind of, like, bends out and stuff like that, like, that stuff was new for animation, you know, like, there was just, like, nothing like it, like, even, like, big budget stuff like Disney wasn't doing that kind of thing, so, like, you know, it was, you know, it's, it's really, really groundbreaking, and, like, you know, I, I think the world is really, really interesting and um, certainly worth, like, delving into for longer than the movie has, um, which isn't really, like, a dig on the movie because, like, you know, it, it, it's as long as it is, you know. But I, I just, like, I do think it gets bogged down by the politics and the, um, and, like, kind of the weird way that the main character's arc is paced. So, like, for me, it just feels a little bit, it's a great idea that I find a little underwhelming at the end, you know, even though, like, the ending I do think is really, really good and would hit harder if that other stuff was a little better. And some of this might be um, up to the dub or whatever, you know, like, maybe I would feel a little more connected to the major if, you know, I was listening to the original voice actor, but unfortunately there's no way to rent that version. I know, I checked YouTube, I checked Hulu, I checked, I looked everywhere, I cannot find the sub. Yeah, if I'm you want to watch your sub, you have to. anniversary Blu-ray, and I chose the so, dub. So, you anyway. S- um, psychotic. You know, I might change this later upon a different rewatch, but I'm giving it a 6 out of 10, which is, like, a, a step above average for me. Like, I generally give, like, an average, like, you know, it does as much bad as it does good movie, a 5 out of 10. And I think this does have a lot of great stuff in it, so I'm going to give it a 6. Before I get into saying what I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to call Josh out on this one and say that's the lowest score he's ever given anything. Um, in, his, in, his, in his, in his, well, <laughs> out, in his, like, appearances on recorded media. Um, I will say I share a lot of the same opinions as Josh. Uh, the concepts and the world and the artistic design of everything. Mm-hmm hold it together just enough for me to feel comfortable giving it an 8. I really see where it's going. I really appreciate it. I really love all the heady bullshit. 
I really love all the action set pieces. It's too short. It focuses on things that it, it... It just wastes time on things, time that it doesn't have, because it is already too short. Um, that being said, I feel like it's a solid 8 out of 10. I'd love to watch it again. I'd love to delve into the expanded universe, just the standalone complex, all that shit. Uh, I, I love this kind of stuff, so I'm 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 here for it. Is standalone complex streaming on anything? Do you guys know? Uh, I think um, it might be on Hulu, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's on Hulu. Um, um, it used to be on Netflix, but I don't think it is anymore. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's on. Um, uh, uh, maybe you should check Hulu. <laughs> Um, hey man, no. Hulu has has some good anime selection. I mean, you could always just it's, check Nine Anime if you really don't. It's uh, not on anything yeah, unless you have um, access that. to Adult Swim via your cable uh, subscription. So I do. Well, Brogan, uh, what would you give the movie on like a number scale, like one, a, a seven, an eight, an eight, an eight out of ten, an eight out of ten? Okay. So I, I feel like we all kind of like fall in line on this one. Um, Except yeah, I'm totally gosh. in favor of it. I'm in favor of it. I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a hater. I just Star Wars movie, you know, the contrarian movie, contrarian guy. Just <laughs> saying. Me, um, me and uh, Clayton were talking about um, maybe doing Cruella on the show, and you know, I was going to be the contrarian to him on that. That movie. might that might happen. There's some. There's some. We're going to have a Cruella fight. <laughs> I suppose I'll have to watch it now. I mean, you don't have to. You know, we can just leave it to I, the two of us. I will. I will. I'll okay. Do it. If you want to, right. I'm tapping out. I'm not watching that <laughs> dog shit. I'm just glad it's free on Disney Plus now. So that's a good point. Um, free is an interesting way to say ten dollars a month. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I think that about wraps us up for Ghost of the Shell. Um, I want to give a very special thank you to our friends Brogan and Josh from How to Otaku coming on this episode. Uh, we're going to be dropping our Matrix review pretty soon. Uh, we're going to just have some extra content coming out this month. Uh, we're also going to be doing a podcast with How to Otaku uh, on Akira. So look out for that. Uh, in the yep. meantime, we'll catch you on the next Inner Circle. See you around, everybody. See you, Space Cowboy. Peace. It's only when I'm submissive and breedable on the battlefield. The only time I truly feel alive.